today for their budget. We're going to start out today with uh, our guest speaker, Ms. Linda Hudson. Uh, I don't want to take up all her time reading all the things she was able to accomplish in her career, but I want to go over this because um, I want you to understand the advantage you're going to have to be able to talk with her and ask her questions. Um, actually, before I do that, General Hagenbeck, welcome back to class. Meg Hendricks, Director of Engineering Alumni Development. I'm sorry. Tate Michael. Tate Michael. <laughs> I knew that. I was just about to say that. Tate Michael, <laughs> our colleague. And um, um, welcome, everybody. I'll introduce you guys later next hour. So, oh, yeah, Ms. Hudson. She's currently founder, chairman, CEO of the Cardia Group. That's a consulting group that sort of helps organizations in adaptive strategies and organizational transformations. But um, she retired as president and CEO of BAE Systems, which is a major uh, defense corporation. Uh, she led 40,000 employees and $12 billion company throughout, uh, throughout a global environment. Um, she was an outside director of BA Systems on the board of directors as well. She was president of various groups there, a largest military vehicle and equipment business with operations around the world. Just you know, put the connection in with a woman engineer working in, in this environment uh, and being able to do what she did. Um, you know, seven years as an officer and VP of General Dynamics and president of their armament and technical products division. A lot of senior management, senior leadership roles throughout a, a variety of engineering production and operations and program management, business development strategies. She was with Harris Corporation, Ford Aerospace, a um, lot of accolades, USO's 2011 Woman of the Year Distinguished Service Award. Um, interestingly here, she's been recognized as the leader of Trailblazer in what she does. Um, featured numerous articles here. The London Times proclaimed her as the first lady of defense. I thought was sort of interesting. Um, I don't want to embarrass her, but I mean, these accolades just go on and on. Cited one of the Fortune magazine's 50 most powerful women, one of Washington magazine's 100 most powerful women in Washington. Uh, maybe most importantly, she's a Gator engineer. And, uh, and uh, she got her bachelor's degree here in, in systems engineering with honors. Um, she remains active here in the Alumni and Athletic Association. She's on the advisory board for the College of Engineering. She has been honored as a Distinguished Alumni Award, and also will get in the hall. She is already a member of the Hall of Fame in the Engineering, Industrial, and Systems Engineering Group. Got an honorary doctorate from Win Win Worcester Polytech <laughs> Institute. You will get getting another one from the University of Florida at the end of December this year. So, Ms. Hudson, thank you so much for taking your time to come talk with us. And uh, class is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to be here. It's always great to be back in Gainesville. You know, my experiences here in Florida and my continuing involvement over the years have had a profound impact on, on who I am today. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time telling you about my journey, what I've learned along the way, and how it has shaped how I lead and what I value. I'll reflect on what I've observed makes an effective leader and what I think you should consider as you move beyond university environment. Then I'll open it up for your questions and a conversation and we can take this wherever you want to go. This has been a year of, of transition for me, having left my corporate role in, in January. I actually hate the word retirement because it sounds so final and as if life is passing you by. I prefer to view it as moving on to do things that I think are important and what I really want to do. To that end, when I left, I wouldn't let my staff give me a retirement party because frankly, they remind me of memorial services. <laughs> I chose to just go out drinking with my friends. So <laughs> some things don't change from when you're here in, in the university environment. Uh, my corporate career was terrific, and it exceeded all my expectations, but it really was time to move on. I actually view the past with gratitude, not regret, but I believe one must always keep moving forward. So taking a brief glimpse at my past, I'm often asked how I became an engineer at a time when women didn't do that sort of thing. I was born in central Georgia, and grew up in North Central Florida, actually not too far from here. A child of two school teachers who always encouraged curiosity, 
learning and self-reliance. Vacations were usually camping trips and we frequently traveled the back roads, the forests, the springs, and the beaches of Florida. As Florida's East Coast was the, was the hub of early space exploration, I developed a fascination with all things that flew at a very young age. And on a clear day from my front yard, we could see the space launches from Cape Canaveral. I desperately wanted to fly, but that was an unrealistic expectation for a young girl in the 50s and 60s. In the seventh grade, a math teacher introduced me to the concept of engineering. Applying my math and science skills to solve real world problems. So I decided if I couldn't fly airplanes, I could design them. I never lost that passion and went on to get my degree here in systems engineering. One of only two women at the time in all the disciplines in my, in my class. As they say, going back in time, the post-World War II days were the best and the worst of times. The GI Bill had created a well-educated middle class and babies were booming. But racism was a scar on our society, but it was largely ignored. Separate but equal was the mantra of the day. I grew up with a strong sense of social justice, having witnessed this massive discrimination in all aspects of society. The days of whites only bathrooms, and separate entrances for coloreds. It never made sense to me, and my parents always tried to teach us fairness and how racism was wrong. Nonetheless, I was a senior in high school before the schools were integrated in my hometown. In many ways, during my formative years, fear was often at the forefront. I remember being terrified as friends built bomb shelters, we had drills at school, and I watched the troops drive through my town toward the south during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The world was on the brink of nuclear war. Discontent escalated with the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy. It was a violent time marked by civil rights, women's rights, and anti-Vietnam War activism. As I grew up surrounded by this volatility, I felt something was different about me from my friends. I was a bit more serious, more determined, and more committed than most to achieve something important and to make a difference. I was outraged by discrimination, particularly against women. This was a time when there was still almost no mingling among the races, and women were clearly second-class citizens. A woman could not hold credit in her own name. There were no laws against sexual harassment, and it was legal for a bank to ignore a woman's salary because she might get pregnant. It was four years after I graduated from college before the Fair, Fair Credit Act was enacted into law, and it was many more years before it was unacceptable and illegal to harass women in the workplace. I was a good student and quickly overcame the professor's biased views about having a female engineer. And because it was a troubled time in our country, I became politically active. All of us students in that era believed we could change the world. And in many ways, we did. I loved being here and supporting causes I believed in. And in the process, I matured into an adult believing I could make a difference. It was a very exciting and stimulating time. People cared and they took action. Entering the workforce was not so positive or exciting. I married right out of college, something in those days I was expected to do, and discrimination was rampant and blatant. I learned to channel the humiliation and anger into a determination to succeed. I was not going to be defeated and was determined to prove to my male colleagues that I deserved to be there. I just focused on doing my job better than it had ever been done before, and that overcame a lot of prejudice. I observed many of my peers were not good communicators, 
so I focus on my verbal and written communication skills. I found myself often being asked to brief customers and to help write proposals and speeches. I learned that your ideas mattered little if they could not be effectively communicated. I volunteered for high-profile assignments. Those early days were an unhappy time for me, but I grew ever more resilient every year. It was not until we moved to California that things got better. It was, more op it was a more open and welcoming society than the South. I actually felt like I fit in for the first time as an adult. I continued to observe the successful people I admired. And in addition to their competence in their field, I learned that good manners, etiquette, and appropriate attire were a part of their repertoire, and that they all treated people fairly and with respect. Those characteristics matter as much today, maybe even more than they did then. Life went on. I had a daughter, and my career began to take off. I rarely felt burdened by being a female from my mid-30s on, and my professional reputation was growing rapidly. As my career successes multiplied, my marriage deteriorated. We divorced after 24 years of marriage, and my daughter was a senior in high school. She is now married to an active duty Marine, and they have three kids. I love grandparenting. It gives me a chance to do over on mistakes I made the first time around with my daughter. I share this brief glimpse at my life because my background shapes who I am, what I value, and how I lead. I am passionate about fairness and particularly committed to promoting the benefits of diversity in life and business. As you might expect, the rights of women have always been at the forefront of my agenda. Since almost every job I had was the first time it had been held by a woman, I felt I not only carried the weight of my own success on my shoulders, but that of every woman who might follow me and pursue a non-traditional role. If I failed, perhaps no other woman would be given the opportunity. My recent exit from corporate life finally lifted that burden from my shoulders. Having witnessed so much bigotry and hatred masquerading as social correctness, I developed a passion for people who are honest, transparent, authentic, and straightforward. I believe as human beings we are all in this together and that there is an obligation to help others, particularly those less fortunate. Philanthropy has been a cornerstone of who I am and what I expect of others. Life became a continuous learning experience for me, and I work hard at not becoming a dinosaur. Perhaps it is because of my parents and their passion for teaching that I believe nothing is more important than high-quality education. Working in the national security space for 41 years helped me hone an already strong sense of patriotism and pride in being an American. Being able to provide goods and services to the men and women in the military and intelligence agencies instilled a purpose about what I did and why I did it. The products we built and the services we provided saved lives and helped keep our nation safe. That higher sense of purpose got me out of bed every day, anxious to go to work. As I took on increasingly senior roles, I realized that what I liked most about being the boss was the people side of the job. While I enjoyed the technical challenges, motivating and inspiring people to do things as a group that they never envisioned they could do alone brought me great joy and satisfaction. I learned to live with the increasing loneliness at the top because I enjoyed being in charge. I'm known for being a clear and decisive leader, able to distill complex facts and circumstances into concise direction and actions. I hold people accountable, and there are consequences for both good and bad outcomes. I have a reputation for being very tough, yet people like working for me, and many have followed me from one job to another. 
I work hard, but I play hard. I'm passionate about things that matter to me and believe fun is a critical part of life and work. I've traveled to 35 countries, love to read, family and friends matter immensely to me, and I have many interests outside of work, including being a rabid Gator fan. Yeah. These very traits and attributes are what I look for in the people I hire, though every person and generation goes about it in their own unique way. I learned a lot from the experiences of my 64 years. I learned to treat people fairly and that everyone matters. We need the janitor every bit as much as we need the engineer, and all should be treated with dignity. I learned that hard work is a must, but good judgment and intuition play an important role. I learned to trust my instincts, but gather data from others and not be afraid to change my mind. I think time matters, and one must act quickly and decisively in every aspect of life. I believe leaders are defined by having the courage to take whatever information is available and make a decision have the conviction to follow it through, and have the understanding that they and they alone are accountable for the outcome. Employees expect their leaders to collaborate, but act decisively. The worst bosses I ever had are the ones who struggled to make decisions, leaving the organization to flounder without clear direction or purpose. These lessons are as applicable to public officials and nonprofit leaders as they are to for-profit leaders. As I thought, thought about how best to use the knowledge I've gained and share my experiences to benefit others, I decided for the next act of my life, I wanted to focus on leadership. I have founded a consulting practice called the Cardea Group. I chose the name Cardea because Cardea is the Greek goddess of threshold and change. I believe the ability to adapt, change, and move forward is the most important attribute of continued success. I have transformed companies, cultures, and careers. And now I want to build on my interest in people and how they work and lead, because I think the world needs more ethical and effective leaders that know how to make things happen and get things done. My colleagues and I build upon our own ideas and experiences to help create better outcomes in life and work for the leaders of today and tomorrow. We are focused on implementing and managing change in leadership, organizations, and strategies in the public and private sector to help accelerate success. The world is changing rapidly, and only those companies and leaders able to adapt and embrace that change will succeed and provide the best outcomes for their stakeholders. The way we work, how we work, and where we work are continuously changing with technology cycles and different generational expectations. It's an exciting time to be on the forefront of redefining how we work, live, and lead. Having mentored and coached countless emerging leaders, advised many senior colleagues, and served on four boards, I'd like to share my thoughts on what you need to be a successful leader in the world today. Any leadership role requires that you juggle the interests of many stakeholders. In a public company, these can include employees, customers, shareholders, regulators, board members and media, to name a few. The style, substance, and approach with one group do not necessarily work well with another. In effect, you must become a jack of many trades, always on and always responsible. The 24-7 nature of the CEO role wore heavily on me until I developed a coherent way to understand and cope with all the personas I had to own in order to meet the needs of others while maintaining an interesting and rewarding personal life. Let me reinforce that I think it is critical to have a healthy, interesting, and exciting personal life. 
the most successful people I have known have been well-read, well-traveled, and engaged in interesting and challenging personal activities. I believe in taking time off, and I require my employees to take their vacations. But there is a Kathy hut. You cannot just disconnect because your responsibilities never go away. This is where I have to say there is no such thing as work-life balance. But there is a way to effectively integrate work and life. Different time zones dictate that we must work many hours in many places. But this also allows us to play or take time off in as many different hours and places. This is what work-life integration is all about. Being comfortable with moving back and forth between your work and personal lives as required and taking the most advantage of both of them. So as I wrestle with the many faceted aspects of leadership, I learned that I had to have an inside persona, the person that ran the business, managed the people, led the vision and strategy and made things happen. I also had to have an outside persona, the person that was the public face of the company, met with customers, represented the company brand as well as my own, interacted with the media, and lobbied outside stakeholders like Congress and regulators. But underpinning and integrating the inside and outside me was the authentic me, the real person with values, hopes, desires, aspirations, family, friends, and personal goals. Once I focused on the skills development and needs of all three of my critical personas, I more effectively managed my life and did not get overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. Helping people hone their own versions of the inside you, outside you, and authentic you is the focus of much of my work today before you can effectively lead a business or drive a strategy for business success, you must manage yourself, communicate clearly, and get the leadership part right. As you go forward, I suggest you think about your three personas. The inside you. This is all about excellence in your field, collaborative work methods, effective decision making, accountability, dependability, many of the things addressed during your time here, and actually the easiest of the personas to master. Then there's the outside you. This is all about how the world sees you, hears you, and forms an impression of you. This is about how you look, how you communicate, your social graces, your style, and your ability to get your point across, convince, and inform others. This is the soft stuff, and it matters every bit, if not more than the hard stuff you learned at school. When hiring new engineers, these characteristics were the ones we found most lacking. Your technical skills are absolutely meaningless if you cannot communicate your ideas and adapt to any situation and fit in with others. You will be working, regardless of what you do, with multiple generations and different cultures in business and social environments. It actually does matter if you know what to wear, which fork to use, and how to order wine and host a business dinner anywhere in the world. Since many people aren't taught this at home anymore, I included etiquette training in my leader development programs. And lastly, there's the authentic you. This is just about being real and not being afraid to let people know the real you. Men often struggle with this more than women because it can make you a bit vulnerable. But people want to follow authentic leaders. And it is so much easier to be yourself than to live behind a facade. This is where philanthropy blossoms and your humanity comes to light. 
This is the person people want to know. Bring your experiences and point of view to work. It is important to have your diverse perspectives in play. Also, live your life to the fullest and find a job that matters to you. A higher sense of purpose is a powerful motivator. As I reflect on my career and what has been, I never started out to blaze trails. I just wanted to be a good engineer. But I became a trailblazer and opened many doors for women and others with diverse backgrounds. My career was one of first, culminating in being the first woman to ever lead a major aerospace and defense company. Though it was never about power, Fortune magazine has called me one of the most powerful women in business. I was just a little girl in Florida who wanted to fly airplanes and fortunate enough to have parents that instilled the confidence and determination in me that I could do anything I wanted. I had an excellent engineering education that taught me to think and solve problems quickly, a skill that has served me well in work and life. Even though there were disappointments, tragedies, and volatile times along the way, those tough transitions were where I found out who I really was. Through it all, I have learned to embrace change, constantly evolve, value diversity, cherish family and friends, enjoy work, care deeply about my community and country, share my good fortune, and have a lot of fun along the way. So I hope these glimpses into my life and my experiences and my observations about leaders resonate in some way with you and the challenges you have yet to face. I have been a follower of the work on leadership done by Warren Bennis, a noted author and founder of the University of Southern California's Leadership Institute, where he was a professor the last 35 years of his life. I had the pleasure of working once with Warren and being invited to the Kennedy School at Harvard when they paid a tribute to his life and work. Warren died this summer at the age of 89 having told friends he was working on a new book he would probably call Grace. He said, and I quote, I think that may be just the name for a book that is going to deal with the issues of generosity, respect, redemption, and sacrifice, all of which sound vaguely spiritual, but all of which I think are going to be required of leadership. I couldn't agree more. Gone are the days of autocratic leaders who cared little for their employees or society and gave little of themselves for the good of the business, others, or those less fortunate. Extraordinarily, extraordinary challenges face us. Our resources are limited and the world has never been more unsettled. It will take exceptional leaders to effectively shape your future and the future of my grandchildren. You are poised to address those challenges if you choose to step forward. At BAE Systems, I created a senior leader development program for a select few individuals with executive potential. When they graduated from the program, I always closed my remarks with one final thought from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., and I will close with it today. He said, and I quote, I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. We must sail, sometimes with the wind, sometimes against it, but we must sail and not drift nor lay at anchor. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I look forward to your questions, and may you all say on. Thank you. Well, before we start our questions, um, sort of a loss for words, but uh, <laughs> I really want to thank you for um, 
condensing the, the intent and the content of this course into a very successful application of engineering leadership success. And uh, I thank you for that. So, <clears throat> rare opportunity for you guys. That and we can go wherever you want, by the way, to know. <laughs> so. so, I do want to get your own speaker here. So. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Cohen Harris. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for sharing. Um, I think that the way you pinpointed your traits and your development as a leader was uh, excellent and uh, quite inspiring. And uh, a question I have for you is, what was your first leadership opportunity coming out as a new uh, entry-level woman engineer? They, it, it, they kind of evolved. But I was fortunate when I graduated to go to work for the Harris Corporation, which does a lot of support, continues for for this university and this school in particular. And one thing I found about Harris that I did not necessarily find about other companies I worked for later in my career was as a, as a new design engineer, work, we worked in groups, which was quite, quite forward thinking in the early 70s. They really hadn't gotten into team and collaboration ideas. And, and, and they put us in groups working on a project and team leads were established. And I would say I was six to eight months into my first job when I became a team leader on a, on a project. And it wasn't a big project, but it was a project. And I had to learn to manage a budget. I had to learn to define work scope for my colleagues and to pull it all together. So that was really the first, the first kind of unofficial leadership job I had. It wasn't until, good heavens, I left Harris and moved to California and went to work for what was then Ford Aerospace that I actually had the first job with manager, you know, tagged after my, after my name. And, and it was there, it was still within, <coughs> excuse me, the engineering and systems engineering, <coughs> excuse me, back and forth and my allergies come back. Um, so I, I, I worked in reliability engineering and did some systems engineering work uh, where I was what they called a program manager, but my first, line job, if you will, I became the head of quality assurance for the division. The most awful job anybody could ever have in their life, by the way. <laughs> but I, it was the first time I had a lot of people actually, I had like 200 and some odd people working for me. And I was then, I actually have to think back time-wise, I was pushing 30, was my first real line management job, having graduated right before I turned 22, so, so that kind of gives you some sense. And, and again, keep in mind, it was quite radical back in the 70s to have a female in, just in the industry I was in, much less in a, in a leadership job. But once you get over that kind of first hurdle, things start to, to go a little easier. All right, Axel, go there and we'll come back to you. Good morning, uh, my question is, being a woman engineer, you saying that's uh, really a, you are a pioneer in your field. What did you do to really gain all of your um, coworkers' trust that you really could be a, a contributing member of a team? You had to be really good. I mean, and I think there's some of that <coughs> still today. That if you're different, you're held to a different standard than many of your white male colleagues because people, when you walk in the door, assume you're incompetent until you prove otherwise where I think white men in particular have the advantage of being assumed competent until you prove otherwise. So, um, and, and it's not as, as true today, but even in the workforce I had for the female engineers to be taken seriously, they, they pretty much had to be better than their peers. And that was clearly true when I was there. And I was good, by the way, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go over here and then we'll come back to Rob. What's your first name again? Hi, uh, my name is Virat. Um, you said you traveled to 35 different countries. And I, my question is, uh, what did you learn while you were abroad that you, could, you think you couldn't have learned in the US, staying in the US, leadership-wise, leadership skills-wise? That's a very good question. Um, I learned that there's a lot of different ways to do things right. And there's not just, not just one way. And that the importance of, of respecting the cultures in which you work is, is extremely important to be successful. You can't come storming into you know, a completely different culture as an American, particularly as a female American in some cultures, 
and expect people to react positively to you. So I always took the time to learn about where I was going, always was respectful of the people I was with, and went into situations thinking I could learn from them uh, how to do things differently and more effectively. And particularly today, where we all have workforces that come from many different cultures and people have many different points of view. I think being able to learn how other people get things done and get things done well, and that it doesn't just have to be the way we were raised or the way we were taught was, was very, very important. And I also can't stress the importance of just understanding the broader world and what's going on. So many Americans don't travel and don't go places. And you, know, you get on the various coast and you get people that have had experiences. You get into middle America and oftentimes people have never traveled. And, and I think what a narrow perspective that brings on just about everything you do if you haven't seen the way other people live and the way other people think. And, and I, I wouldn't change that for the world. I, I'm on a quest to see every place there is to see. So, and have instilled that in my, in my daughter and my grandkids. They love to travel and go as well. Rob? So, this, yeah, my name is Rob. Um, I had a follow-up question on some of the, like, the, the prejudices and, and resistance that you saw in the workplace. And my question is, is what effects did you see on your own personality? How did that change your personality? And how, how, I guess, open to changing your personality? Was there a lot of internal resistance to changing that persona that you give off? Or, You, you know, early on, though I didn't realize it uh, until later, and I went through my divorce and actually spent some time with a psychologist, that I had developed a tremendous amount of anger at the way I had been treated. And that I kept a lot of stuff inside that made me not the nicest person in the world. And, and so while it took a difficult time in my life to help me realize that I wasn't even being honest with myself, much less being honest with other people about how I felt and what it meant and you know how it's not nice to be treated badly. And, and yet I had to cope with it. And you couldn't complain because you get fired and there was no recourse if you did. So my daughter will tell you that when I got divorced is when I turned into a nice person. And I think some of that is, is, is it made me just step back and take a hard look at who I was. And from that point on, it became a lot easier for me to just be me. And when I was angry, to talk about being angry and to work through it rather than just keeping it inside. So I, I think... I was guilty of what I told you you shouldn't do in the early part of my career was trying to be something that I wasn't and trying to pretend like it didn't matter when it did. And I left all that behind quite a while ago. So you can step back and reflect and you know deal with things and then move on and adjust. Coming down. Sam? Hi, my name's Sam. Um, you said it, visiting 35 different countries. Uh, which country, if you recall in specific, shocked you at how well you're treated as a woman, in, especially in your role? And the other one is which country shocked and, me at how yeah. badly I was treated? <laughs> there you go. I have both extremes, by the way. Um, it's a lot of them, it just wasn't an issue at all. But I guess I was most surprised in countries like Oman, you know, you go to the Middle East or the UAE, and the countries in the UAE, it was no issue whatsoever being female. In countries like Australia, most of Europe, not all of it, but most of Europe is, is pretty welcoming. India, no issue whatsoever. Africa, no issue. Well, Africa's a continent. South Africa, Kenya, <laughs> places like that. You can't really generalize about Africa. Uh, I've never had any issues. The countries where I had the biggest issues were largely in, in Asia, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, um, and Germany. Interestingly enough, in Germany, given that they have a female leader, I had very difficult business experiences in, in Germany. Southeast Asia, no problems at all. Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, places like that. 
So it's, it's different. And every culture has its own little nuances and, and twists and turns. Most of the time, it's not a problem. But on a few occasions, it's been pretty ugly. Back over here. Hey, back again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what was your uh, biggest transition or concern going into management from, or management consulting from the corporate world? Well, I'm still in that, that okay. transition. It's, um, you know, ironically, the biggest transition for me is giving up the corporate jet, frankly. It was really <laughs> hard. <laughs> I had not been on a, uh, and I know this sounds tacky, but it's true. I had not been on a commercial airplane in four years. And it was a great perk that came along with, with the corporate job. And going back to being a road warrior and slogging through airports again, it's been um, a challenge. Because I find with a consulting job, I, I travel every bit as much. And yet, I'm having to do it you know, like most people do it now. And so it's um, and not that I didn't do it before. It just I got very accustomed to, to flying around in private airplanes. So that's, that's been different. And I now have, you know, four or five people that work for me instead of 40,000 people that work for me. So that's, that's different. It, it's, but it's fun. I mean, the stress levels are much nicer now than they were before. I'm not living quarter to quarter trying to meet you know, financial targets, which you do in the big corporate world. You live and die by your financial numbers. You know, now I'm my own boss, and it's my own money, so I do worry about the financials, but I'm not trying to meet a bunch of shareholders' expectations and analysts' expectations on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. So I think I'm going to enjoy this. I would say it's a little too early to, to know for sure how it's all going to play out. But it's, it's fun to pay attention to what I want to pay attention to, not what I have to pay attention to. And, and I just find that very refreshing. And I'm meeting whole new circles of friends. I'm doing board work now as well. I'm on the board of Bank of America. And for an engineer to be on the board of a major financial institution has been a huge learning experience. But to the bank's credit, they realized they had no one on their board that understood anything about cybersecurity. And I, one of my businesses was in the security and cybersecurity space. So I know a lot about cybersecurity. And they also had no one on their board that had any international business experience. And I've spent the last God knows how many years traveling around the world, doing business around the world. So those were the things I could bring to the bank. What I underestimated grossly would be how hard it would be for me to learn the banking side of the equation. I've been on that board for two years now, and I can honestly say I finally do understand what they're talking about in the board meetings. <laughs> but it took about that, that long. I'm also on the board of the Southern Company, which is a, an electric utility holding company that has Georgia Power, Mississippi Power, Alabama Power, Gulf Power, and a non-regulated -regulate, entity entity called Southern Power. So I'm learning about energy as well. And that was one of my stated objectives when I left the corporate world was to try and work in a board capacity on other highly regulated industries because I thought that was really the only place I could add value. Defense is a highly regulated industry. And so I've joined those two boards and I am exploring opportunities to join another one, but I'm going to take my time and pick something I really want to do. Got time for some more. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Amanda. Um, how did you find a balance um, when you were in a leadership role between being perceived as competent and being perceived as likable? Because I feel like that's a huge issue. You want people to like you, but you also want them to respect you and follow you. And we talked about this in class a couple of weeks ago. So what was the balance for you? I never cared about being liked. I cared about being respected. And what you find is you end up being surrounded by people that, if you're lucky, you also like, and they also like you. But being liked was never a requirement of mine. This is not a popularity contest. It's about being good at what you do and being respected at what you do, and the rest of it pretty much takes care of itself. I've seen a lot of people do some really bad things trying to be liked. I worked for a guy where being liked was more important to him than being competent. 
and I would suggest that you'll be liked for the right things if you do your job well. And, and if you go on a campaign to be liked, you're more than likely going to miss the things you ought to be doing to run your business. Because sometimes you're going to make decisions that all the people around you won't like, and you still have to get it done. That's why it gets lonely in these jobs at times. Question. Back this way. Back this, way. this is the Actually. vocal crowd yeah, over this here. <laughs> Not as fast as Jerry Springer. Let's pass it back. So what from your, um, all of your experiences, if you had to pick something, or maybe you, you're happy with everything, would you change, and why would you change it? I don't spend a lot of time looking back and saying, what would I have changed? Because it's a pretty useless, um, useless exercise. And I believe you, you, know, you end up being who you are because of what happened. But having said that, there's nothing professionally I would look back and say I would change. On a personal level, I wished I'd never changed my name when I got married. Because having been divorced now about you know, 15 or so years, Hudson is not my name. And yet, by the time I got divorced, my professional reputation was tied up in my name. And it would have been foolish to have changed it back. So if I could flip a switch and do anything over again, my name would be Linda Parker and not Linda Hudson. But that's the only, that's the only regret, if you will, that, that I have at this point. Same to you. So you, uh, you mentioned some of the challenges that, that you know, your generation helped solve, the Civil Rights Movement and the Cold War, um, a, lot of, a lot of those, those things. What, and you touched a little bit on what you project to be the challenges that our generation will address, but can, can you elaborate a little bit more on what those challenges are and some of the implications of, of working through those challenges? Sure. That's a, an excellent question. I mean, clearly, I think the environment, you know, pick your... Pick your you know, your thrust, global warming, dependence on, on petroleum fuels, or, you know, carbon, it, pick it. But I think the environment will increasingly become an important uh, point of dialogue. It is in, in Europe much more so than it is here in the U.S. I think the U.S. will sooner or later come around to the importance of having to manage through scarce resources and the damage we're doing to the world, which was something in my generation nobody really paid much attention to at all. Yeah, all you have to do is travel throughout Africa to realize the huge damage being done to ecosystems and such, and know somebody has got to step up and, and, and deal with this. And I know many of the younger people I've interfaced with have a strong sense of, of what you'd call social responsibility in many terms, and, and I think the environment's an important part of it what's going on in the world, finding a way to have some semblance of peaceful coexistence, helping root out extremism in all forms, left, right, religious, political. I, I just think the mess we have on our hands right now in the United States where we cannot get reasonable people to come together and govern the country, the situation we see going on in Northern Africa and the Middle East with religious extremism and I mean you can pick a whole host of different things but but good people finding a way to come together and respect differences and realize we're never all going to think the same way about everything yet we have to get along and move forward is something I find extremely um, dismal both here at home politically and in the world geopolitically it's it's hard to see how we're going to get out of this and all of you will be dealing with that, unfortunately, I think, for, for some time to come. So how can we as human beings you know, work through the, the kinds of things we see happening? How can we enable the countries that now are struggling to find some degree of enlightened leadership thrive? And you know, the the Arab awakening, or pick your term for what happened in the Middle East and Northern Africa held such promise and hope for many and has turned into such mess. So how can those of us who have capabilities and skills contribute to, to, to help 
with, with what's going on in the world. You know, when you have big powers like China and the United States with very different perspectives and, and governments, yet somehow we manage to coexist because we're mutually dependent upon one another. How can we take many of those kinds of thoughts and ideas and through diplomacy and, and exchanges and interchanges help the world work better, I think is crucially important. And, and it's not just about going to war with each other. I mean, that is not the solution. Despite what I did for a living, by the way, I don't think, I don't think that is the solution to what's, what's going on in the world. If we're lucky, having a strong military will deter war, not, not cause it. So I, I just hope all of you are a lot smarter than my generation was and can tackle what I think will be increasingly challenging issues, particularly associated with the environments and the geopolitics of it all. Tom, for a couple more. You got one more? Um, how long were you in the program management office before you took your next step into management? And what were the important factors that uh, separated you from others? I think I roughly a couple of years in, in a program management role uh, before the opportunity came along. And the reason I got the opportunity is I was working on a very large proposal. Uh, in, in the corporate world, working on a proposal, trying to win a big program is an extremely high profile role and they're they're brutal you'll work seven days a week sometimes for months on end trying to get a proposal out and during the course of this proposal I was doing the reliability engineering part of the proposal the person doing the quality assurance part of the proposal quit so the manager of the proposal asked me if I would pick that up I didn't know anything about quality assurance so I said sure you know and and went on to, to do both parts of the proposal. We won the job. We won the job. It was such a big job, we created a new division in the company. And he asked me to be the, the quality assurance manager of the, of the new division in the company. And it's all about putting yourself out there, being willing to take on you know, high profile assignments and not saying no when you're, even when you don't really know whether you can do it or not. I just. I figured I could figure it out. So um, many of my promotions came from a willingness to take on assignments other people didn't want and being willing to take the risk. It didn't all work out, but many of them did. OK, I think we're back to Amanda for the last question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you love reading and you love travel. So what's one book everyone should read and one place everyone should go? The one place everyone should go is Kenya. It, Followed closely behind by Israel, by the way, in my view, but, and, and then followed closely behind by about 10 other places that I thought were magnificent. But I've been to Kenya four times, and I just find the, the during the Great Migration in particular, the, the animals, the open expanse, the opportunity to get away from the world that we know it has just been an extraordinary experience for me. And, had the opportunity to share that with my daughter and my granddaughter, and fortunately they, they loved it as much. In terms of one book, boy, that one's, that one's hard. The book I find, from a business book perspective, let me go to the business book world, it's really hard. You get into fiction, there's, you can go anywhere you want from, you know, from Fifty Shades of Grey to God knows where, but it's, um, let's go to business books, because that's far safer territory. Um, <laughs> There's a book I find I go back to year after year after year, and it's a relatively small book, and it's called Leading Change. It's written by a guy named John Cotter, a professor at Harvard. And it just is succinct, almost a how-to, you know, go through major change. And I know when I've had to reorganize a business or restructure something, I find myself pulling out that, that book, and it's dog-eared in terms of, you know, what are the steps you need to go through to effectively implement change? And so if you don't have that, I would su suggest you add that to your, to your repertoire. And Warren Bennis, the guy I mentioned in my prepared remarks, he has a book called On Becoming a Leader. That's quite old. It's been out for a very, very long time. But it is an extraordinary book on what it means to be a leader. So I would add those to the to the list. We have that condensed version of that book in a Harvard Business Review article that one of the teams would be. It might be your team, I don't remember. Oh, good. Anyhow, 
Um, all right. Um, unfortunately, for your schedule, we're at the end of the uh, end of the time. I, I will again I want to thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you around next semester in January, I think the university is having another uh, leadership symposium, and I understand Ms. Hudson will help be coordinating, facilitating some of that. So you get another chance, hopefully, to see her and talk with her. Um, Buster, anything from you? No, just thanks for being. I know how difficult your schedule is, and then I'll talk all of for you. Well, it's always great to be here, and thank you all very much for your attentiveness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's take a five-minute break. Oops. Excuse me.